Well, good morning. Um, my name is Michal Buchowski, and I was asked to deliver this talk to this distinguished audience, and I am really honored to be here, especially with the topic that concerns most of us present in this room, that is hierarchies of knowledge and dilemmas that we face with respect to this topic or this problem, this issue, which concerns not only anthropology, but I think also other disciplines, especially in the social sciences and humanities. So let me start with some introductory remarks. So I will show that the decolonization of academia and working against the existing pecking order of knowledge, also within anthropology, is a strenuous and so far very ineffective process. A lot of ink has been spilled on existing intellectual inequalities between the global south and the global north. And there is a, a whole bunch of scholars like Ben Ari, Cadenia, Coronil, Di Giacomo, Linz Ribeiro and Escobar, of this famous volume for, from 2006. Also on intellectual aspects of knowledge production, domination of Western epistemology, and the necessity to dethrone, or at least relativize it, Minolo, Niamonjoch, Grossvogel, well-known discussion on provincializing Europe have a long tradition. Stuart Hall, Chakrabarty, Benoit de Lestual. The topic of convoluted orders and grading, gradings between post-Cold War Eastern and Western knowledges or post-socialist Eastern European countries and capitalist Western European countries. Uh, or in other words, between Western, mostly Anglo-American French anthropologists and of Central and Eastern European ethnologists has also been discussed, not only well, by myself, but Kurti and Skalnik, Jasna Chapo, Hanna Czerwinkova, Chris Hahn, Martin, more recently Martinez, Kojanic, and many others. Moreover, several diagnoses were made on unfair inequalities of knowledge production, knowledge producers, and of knowledge knowledges produced at various uh, produced, and various therapies were prescribed to cure this kind of disease. They are meant to facilitate the multi-directional flow of ideas instead of the so far predominant model in which ideas travel always from the West to the rest, to cite Kacper Pobłocki. That is from Western academic centers to provincial academies, all in inverted, inverted commas. Highly sophisticated arguments articulated in post-colonial studies genre, Czerwinkowa, Pobłocki, post gramscian hegemony, Restrepo and Escobar, for instance, and the uniqueness of Western epistemology, even ontology, Grossvogel, Nyan Joch. My aim is modest and concrete here. I will show that this tidal wave of critique and intellectual attempts, conferences devoted to these problems, manifestos, World Anthropology Network, Luzan Manifesto, uh, Etc., uh, etc. Et Special issues of journals like Focal, Forum, Cargo, Etnolowska Tribuna, yeah, we can find all these articles there, and appeals have very limited effect. Democratizing endeavors of a discipline exercised in various corners of the world turned out to be Sisyphus efforts. My conclusion is therefore pessimistic. There is no space to recount all arguments raised up to date. My starting point is a statement from a World Council of Anthropological Association, which exists for several years, for at least for more or less 15 years, 
which states that yeah, WCAA's mission is inter alia to promote worldwide communication and cooperation in anthropology, to debate a diversity of views and perspectives, and to discuss how the profession can res respond to contemporary challenges that are themselves often the product of forces and relations beyond the level of individual nation state. It also aims to disseminate anthropological work in a multiplicity of languages, to improve knowledge of world anthropologists, counteract the hegemony of English-based knowledge production, and enable different, sorry, <coughs> only once, different local publics to learn about the results of anthropological research in their own, in their own languages, yes. So there is even, let's say, an organization which aim is to promote such a pluri, pluriversality of anthropological uh, knowledge. In order to show this problem, I will go, also go beyond anthropology and proceed in three steps by providing some rudimentary data that merely illustrate the larger and quite obvious phenomenon of existing inequalities in the academic world in general and in anthropology in particular. First, and it might be a bit controversial, but I do it on purpose, I will begin with a global picture of academic work recognition using a sample of the most prestigious accolade in science, the Nobel Prize. Second, I will move to continental examples in the field of social sciences and humanities by giving statistics related to, related to the competition uh, for European Research Council funds. Third, I will finally move to anthropology itself and evoke instructive data about classification of scholars, scholars in citation index and scholarly recognition in the disciplinary community. I am aware that all these just called up instances are taken out of their context and inevitably close our eyes to complex circumstances. But I think that at the same time they point out perturbing facts. Since, as just mentioned, so many interpretations and explanations have already been put forward, which I have just enumerated here, here I restrict myself to very few comments about this pieces of information. In a sense, I am more concerned with selected empirical evidence that has not so far been put together in one text than with its interpretation. My aim is to make a small contribution to thinking about prolonged inequalities and disparities between the recognition of various knowledges and knowledge producers operating in different social economic contexts. I use easily available data, but I also add some observation based on my experience as a panel member at ERC, chair of the World Council of Anthropological Association and president of European Association of Social Anthropologists. And I am just saying that, well, this is a kind of, of <laughs> ethnographic insight. I didn't do ethnography, but some kind of uh, uh, Ethno ethnographic observations, let's put it this way. Well, <coughs> this is Merton's term, which I use, the Matthew effect in the system of science. Related to economic influence, investment in science, and the efficiency of the academic system, such inequalities are visibly detectable in the most famous and prestigious institution recognizing scientific achievements. Yeah, already mentioned the Nobel Prize. A list, a list of the laureates between 1901 and 2022 is telling. Even if an invocation of this kind of data may raise doubts. On the one hand, one can claim that the Nobel Prize Selection Committee applies Eurocentric measurements, ins measurement instruments for ranking the academic quality of scientific practice. practice. On the other hand, statistics are often, often ambivalent and even misleading. Several prize winners were born in countries different from those where they earned their recognition. 
Some persons are counted for more than one or even two countries, since their nationality, country of emigration, and immigration may differ. In some cases, organization got Nobel Prize uh, Committee recognition. However, taking all this into account, a first country that is non-European, North American, or Japan bestowed uh, the honor, honorary white status, as for instance Noam Chomsky called it, namely India, is listed, uh, listed 18 on, the, on this rank. The United States, with circa uh, 400 prize winners, with Canada 408 by 2019. The United Kingdom, 138, and Germany, 114, are at the top of the rank, well ahead of the following, of the following Russia, Sweden, and Japan. Several countries in Africa, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, have not, have not had a single Nobel Prize winner. Latin America has relatively few, 21 prize laureates, similarly to Africa, 24. Worthy of note is also the distribution of Nobel Prize laure laureates by activity. Four slots are for scientific domains, physics, chemistry, medicine, medicine and physiology, and economy, which technically is not a Nobel Prize, but it is considered a Nobel Prize and is awarded by the committee. One in literature, on top, and on, on top of this, one in literature, and one is the Peace Prize. Poland, my home country, illustrates some points I want to make. On the official list of the Polish Nobel Prize winners are 18, which makes it a quite successful country, 13 in the rank. However, only five of them actually lived in the country at the moment they were awarded the prize. Four out of these five are writers and poets, and one is a Peace Prize, uh, Peace prize winner, namely Lech Wałęsa. Others were born in the changing historically Polish territories, and one among them was a Polish poet. One, of, uh, uh, one uh, Yiddish writer, Isaac Beszewicz Zinker, and three of them, Peace Prize laureates, Shimon Peres and Menachem Begin, both awarded as Israeli citizens, and Joseph or Joseph Rothblatt, a Polish-British citizen, who was, by the way, protesting against proliferation of, of the, of the uh, nuclear uh, armament, and which is quite important in, in the context of the film we probably have watched, that is Oppenheimer. The others, like double laureate Marie Curie, Kodowska, were scientists who worked in the West, France, the UK, and the US. It is noticeable that many of the Polish international laureates are of Jewish origin. It is also striking that no single, single award was granted to a scientist doing his or her research in Poland or working, working at the Polish university. Yeah, just as footnote, yeah, the only Polish university that has scientists on the list is Wrocław, but it was Breslau Universität before it became a Polish, a Polish city. The short account of selected facts allows us to draw at least two important conclusions in the context of this paper. First, there are worldwide inequalities in the appreciation of knowledge, production, and honor distribution across the globe. That, especially in the scientific domain, domain reflects the truth. And I quote Levitt and Krull from 2018 in Etnoloska Tribina, intellectual and cultural inequality are part and parcel of socioeconomic inequality, unquote. Second, economic wealth enabling generous financing of scientific inquiries and thereby facilitating discoveries infrastructurally, organization of academic life, and logistically, laboratories supporting staff, opens possibility for achieving results valued in a scientific community whose members come from the, uh, the same part of the world, that is, the West. Apparently, such opportunities are not available in underfinanced, less prosperous, or impoverished parts of the world. 
in the domain of experimental sciences, for instance, Poland apparently belongs to this category. And I think that other Central and Eastern European countries uh, too. At the end, I will show some data that illustrate how much GDP, percentage of GDP which is spent for, uh, for science in different countries, how it looks like and how it, we can count it in US dollars per capita, for instance. Yeah. Let us again, uh, let us gain another insight into Western dominance. That is the, this time space alone, uh, European space alone. ERC, European Research Council, is a commonly known and, pre and prestigious institution. It announces itself as the premier European funding organization for its excellent frontier research. It funds creative researchers of any nationality and age to run projects based across Europe. And not only across Europe, because there are also cooperative countries and there many awards go also to the states, associated countries, countries that contribute to the ERC budget, uh, Australia, uh, etc. Between 2007, oh, I would like to, okay. Between 2007 and 2022, it funded several thousands projects in different disciplines and in various categories, starting consolidator, advanced and synergy grants. Of course, one should keep in mind that countries vary in, time, in terms of size and population. Yeah? We, nobody expects that the same amount of grants would go to Estonia and to Germany, for instance. Yeah? Not all countries are listed here. However, it is enough to invoke some data to illustrate another uh, conspicuous phenomenon. The United Kingdom, yeah, scholars and institution won 2,470 projects. And you see it, Germany over 2,000, France almost 1,600, the Netherlands almost 1,200, Switzerland almost 900, Belgium 470, Sweden, Austria around 400, Denmark 300, Finland Two, over two, Italy is almost eight, and Spain, 800. Ireland, Portugal, Greece. And then you have Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, the numbers are double digit, not triple digit, and in many cases, only single digit, yeah? And uh, I don't know, the, the, I think that it, illustrates something, yeah, that, well, this Matthew effect, which I will refer to later, it somehow works also within the ERC. Uh, yeah, in terms of overall share in ERC grants between 2014 and 220, which is Horizon 2020, yeah, this was, uh, this is uh, the, these are data for this. And I calculated it just from the, from the diagrams that were there. So these numbers, these percents are approximate, yeah? So you see the uh, distribution of, this, of these grants. Some are yeah, mysterious because ERC has its own nomenclature or signs for this, so maybe some are obvious, but uh, uh, yeah, EL, for instance, at the bottom is Greece, yeah, LNE, and LU is Luxembourg. Uh, uh, EE is Estonia, okay, LT is Lithuania, not Latvia, Latvia is LV, yeah, and then also associated countries. So, yeah, IL is Israel, TR is Turkey, yeah, Iceland, Republic of Serbia, and Ukraine. Uh, well, from these statistics, I just wonder why, why Ukraine participates in it, because apparently it didn't get any, any single grant in this, uh, in this uh, period. Well, uh, 
similar pecking order applies to, to these yeah, uh, social sciences and humanities panel. And I start with SH2, in which anthropology partly participates. It appears, but not very much, but just for an illustration, yeah? Uh, the name of this panel is Institutions, Values, Environment, and, and Space. And then you see the distribution of, uh, of the awards, yeah, the, of, gra of gra uh, projects that were funded in different uh, countries. Uh, again, this is old, the so-called old EU, is, uh, new EU, and uh, associated uh, countries. Yeah. If you look at, at the institutions, why this was, this grant, that won most grants, yeah, or where the most grants were placed, yeah, you, you, in these two panels, SH1 and SH2, with the other one, also anthropologists do participate, but not that much, but you also see it, yeah, this is most, mostly UK, Scandinavia and the Netherlands, yeah? Italy, well, the first one also, Italy and Spain. London School of Economics, University College London, Pompeu Fabra University, London Business School, University of Oxford, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Copenhagen, London, Oxford again. As her SH3 panel, uh, the social world diversity population uh, is concerns us a bit more because yeah, anthropology declared discipline, primary discipline in it is 16%. Uh, yeah, the distribution is very similar. <laughs> well, what can I say? But in that, that respect, Poland is an outlier for Central and Eastern <laughs> Europe. Uh, but again, at the top of the list is the UK, the, uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, very successful in this. Spain, Italy, etc., etc., as you see at the picture, Belgium. Yeah, also Norway, Switzerland, and Israel are quite successful in this respect. And then in this sense, uh, Central and Eastern European countries or New Europe countries are, uh, are, are rather modest, modestly successful. Yeah, uh, and the institutions, which I have already uh, say Again, University of Amsterdam, Oxford, UCL, Utrecht, uh, Oslo and disciplinary distribution. Uh, SH5 panel is also interesting for us because anthropologists is declared by anthropologists, the main discipline is declared by 18% uh, of PIs. Yeah. And the distribution looks very similar. These data, are, I com compiled them, but they are easily available. I mean, it's not, a, uh, it's not a secret. So UK, Germany, Netherlands, France, Belgium, yeah, are the most successful ones. And then, in this respect, Hungary is an outlier. Uh, for, for, our, for Central and Eastern European uh, region. And again, the, the pattern repeats itself that these three associated countries, that is Switzerland and Israel and Norway are quite successful, are, are, are very much successful, yes. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, recently, I think that uh, Switzerland uh, and Britain, Britain, because of the complications that we know, Brexit, and, East, and uh, Switzerland, they withdrew from, from the program in general. 
So, and the institutions within uh, Munich, Oxford, I don't see any Central and Eastern European uh, country on the list. It's again London, Oxford, Munich, and Venice, which is quite surprising, but this is a cultural production. So maybe this is uh, why this is so. So within the frame of, uh, Horizon 22 framework, 2014-20, uh, 6,707 projects were funded with 13, over 13 billion euros uh, budget. Four countries, the United Kingdom, 1,200 awards, Germany, 1,117, France, 70, uh, 70, 38, and the Netherlands, six, uh, over 600, receive more than half of them. Yeah, so four countries, uh, the UK, Germany, France, and the Netherlands uh, have uh, more than half of the share. Within the whole pool of social sciences and humanities, SH, anthropology was seventh among the most used disciplines, labels, 9%. For Central and Eastern European countries altogether, 121 projects were granted. Yeah, so thousands and now altogether 121. Czech Republic, 35, Hungary, 27, Poland, 26, Slovenia, 12, Romania, 10, Estonia, 7, Croatia, 3, Lithuania, 1. Others like Latvia, Bulgaria, and Slovakia did not get a single one. I got it from the mapping uh, from 2021. These 121 projects comprise 1.8% of the whole pool. One has to remember that several associated countries from the outside of the EU contribute to the ERC budget and also compete for these resources, uh, what i shown. And some of them are very successful. Well, the population of EU is in 2020 amounted to circa 448 million. And with the UK until Brexit on January 31, 2020, so Horizon 20 still included, uh, was more than 513 million. This later number should be considered with, the, with respect to the Horizon 2020 perspective. In all post-socialist post countries in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, circa 102 million people live, which is almost 20% uh, in uh, 2019, exactly 19.9, yeah? In a purely numerical perspective, the number of projects accorded to Central and Eastern European countries is more than 10 times lower than the strict proportionality of the whole population would imply. I do realize that decontextual, uh, that decontextualized statistics can be disingenuous. Nevertheless, the above data reveal dramatic inequalities between countries. For instance, Germany has approximately two and one third, third bigger population, times bigger population than Poland, 84 to 38. Or in other words, a population in Poland comprises 45% of the German one. I'm just, it's not that I am obsessed with Germany as Polish government, but uh, just comparing these two, two countries, neighboring countries. A number of Horizon 2020's projects awarded to Germany uh, were 1,117 and Poland 26. It means that Polish scholars or researchers based in Poland received 2.3% of the total number of projects awarded to scholars in German academia. The counted per capita, it comprises almost 20 times fewer projects based in Poland than in Germany. Yeah. So, yeah, we should, a footnote should be made, yeah, that these projects are, uh, uh, these grants are located at certain universities and many scholars from our region, they prefer to go to associate 
their own projects or participate in the projects that are placed in the in the universities in the West, especially in Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and other places where salaries are high, higher. Yeah. And this is about this money now. Moreover, so far as the ERC had, uh, so far at least, the ERC has had a policy that awards money proportionally to salaries in a member state countries. It caused the gap between the West and uh, CEE, Cent Central and Eastern European, to grow even wider. Remuneration for the same amount of work in collaborative projects in the most advanced Western countries was several times higher than in Eastern uh, uh, European states. Of course, the same rule was applied, applied to individual projects. Having this in mind, many scholars from post-socialist countries attempted to affiliate their applications with Western universities. The outcome is brain drain, as we know the phenomenon. I evoke these numbers not to criticize the ERC. That's, that's, that's for sure. Panel members are selected according to fair principles and their choice is informed by experience accumulated over the years. The whole procedure is highly transparent, restricted only to anonymity of evaluators, with the exception of the panels, uh, panel chairs. The sole criterion for proposal evaluation is excellence, and this is the principle that guides board members. There is no reason to think otherwise. But it has also to be realized that all standards for evaluation are socially constructed. This fact is commonly admitted, especially with respect to the social sciences and humanities. Excellency is established in a complex process of negotiation at various levels. Scientific communities worldwide are re and regionally, scientific disciplines and milieus, research coteries, and last but not least, among panel members. The latter are also selected from among scholars coming from science centers prevailingly located in Western Europe. External evaluators are recommend, recommended by the panel members, which predictably leads to their recruitment from, the, from among their own academic networks and implies indirectly a preference for already established research paradigms. Inevitable, it reproduces and privileges dominant standards determined in hegemonic circles. Those from the outside are forced to follow the rule. Assimilate yourself, your modes of thinking, writing, and applying or remain marginalized. Let's now move to uh, symbolic assets in uh, uh, anthropology. How the situation looks in anthropology itself. One of the above mentioned aims of the WCAA is to disseminate anthropology and is to cite disseminate anthropolog anthropological work in a multiplicity of languages. A look at the journal ranking of various types is hardly uplifting in this respect. Let me use only one accessible, uh, use one easily accessible classification, namely CMAGO journal and country ran ranking for 2021. Under the subject study called anthropology, 448 titles are listed. Some are apparently multidisciplinary and or topic oriented but anthropology appears to be the field of interest covered by them. The first three journals with anthropology in the title are evolutionary anthropology, position 10, cultural anthropology, position 14, and the annual review of anthropology, position 16. Among the first 100 titles, 47 are based in the US, 38 in the UK, four in the Netherlands, a top one social networks is ranked at S8. Three in Germany, the first one archaeological and anthropological sciences is ranked 26. Two in France, uh, first one is Journal of Cultural Heritage, which is ranked 42nd. And one in New Zealand, Australia, Italy, Japan and Argentina. Intersecciones and Anthropologia, which is ranked as 90. First, loosely related un to anthropology itself, a journal from the former socialist bloc is ranked at the position 132, Documenta Prehistorica from Slovenia. The first ethnological one, Glasnik SED, 
Slovenian uh, Ethnological Society, and published in Slovenian is at the position 154, while Russian Ethnographiczkoje Obazrenia is 154 too. Exact. Again, some reservations have, have to be made. Rankings merely show some trends. The fact that a journal is based in a given country doesn't mean that it is a national journal. All German titles are published in English by Springer, which is based in Germany. The same goes for several other journals published in the Netherlands, Italy, France, and Japan. Many of the top journals on the list are only partly anthropological, focused on certain regions, for instance, Pacific, China, or topics, peasant studies, consumer studies, race and ethnicity. And many of them are interdisciplinary, linked to psychology, archaeology, or biology. However, the picture seems to be clear. Out of 100 journals, 85 are American or British, 87 are published in Anglo-Saxon countries, 96 are published in Europe and the US, 90, uh, uh, 98 are in English, one is bilingual, using French and English, anthropology, uh, ranked uh, 76, and one is, uh, is non-English journal published in Spanish in, uh, in Argentina, the one that intersecciones, which I have mentioned. Well, people still speak different languages across the world. English has become a lingua franca in business, politics, tourists, and last but not least in science. However, the denomination of English in all of them and in science in particular, is so obvious and as clear as, as, as day that the WCAA postulate of counteracting the hegemony of English-based uh, knowledge production and enabling different local publics to learn about the results of anthropological research in their own languages, unquote, is hand, hardly implementable. Of course, and thanks to God, scholars publish in national or local languages the diversity of which, at least in my opinion, is as necessary for us as biodiversity. Unfortunately, in many regions, this multiplicity is repressed and reduced by the constrict constrictive rules of neoliberal academia, which we all know and experience. Researchers are asked to publish in journals considered global and ranked at the top of bibliometrics uh, in bibliometrics similar to uh, um, to the uh, one referred to above. In the red rat race for positions and prestige, they are rewarded and promoted for practicing the rule of publish or perish, which is tunneled into English-based, uh, Western-based, and preva prevailing the American and British journals. Occupied with the task of publishing in a cosmopolitan amphitheater, Many cannot afford, both time-wise and career-wise, to publish in local languages and journals and educate their domestic public in anthropology. Concentration of publication outlets privileges gatekeepers linked to them, most of them coming from the Western countries, who give priority to ideas that resonate much their own while rebuffing unfamiliar ones. In effect, dominant paradigms are replicated and an orthodoxy is not accepted, accepted. These rules evidently privilege scholars who are native speakers of English or trained in English-speaking academic institutions. This st statement leads me to the next argument. Let us see how hierarchies in statistics are equally available in, as the ones in the journals above. A list of the top influential, most often cited anthropologies. And uh, yeah, a uh, citation from this list. Here we are focused on the number of citations and the web presence of scholars in the last 10 years. It's from 2022. For years 2010-20, the rank looks as follows. Ulf Hannertz, Stockholm. Marshall Salins, Chicago. Nancy Shepard Hughes, Berkeley. David Grebel, LSE. Marcia Inhorn, Yale. Paul Rabinov, Berkeley, David Price, St. Martin's University, Daniel Miller, Miller, UCL, Bruno Latour, Science Po, and Chris Hahn, MPI, Halle, partly Cambridge. With the exception of Hannertz, 
who received his PhD in Stockholm and Latour, who got his degree in Tours, all scholars were trained in the US and the UK. Price earned his degree at the University of Florida, Salins at Columbia, uh, Inhorn and Shepard uh, Hughes at Berkeley, Greber and Rabinov at Chicago, Hahn and Miller at, uni at the University of Cambridge. The list of anthropological academic centers that educate the most popular scholars is very limited, apparently. The situation doesn't uh, change much if we inquire about the list uh, further, e.g. top 20. All the most influential scholars in anthropology are from the US, the UK, France and Scandinavia. No one is from any other Western countries like Germany, Spain, Italy, uh, Austria or, unsurprisingly, from any Central and Eastern European country. The list lacks a single, sco single scholar from a highly populated and having large anthropological association countries such as India, China, Japan, Brazil, Mexico, or Indonesia. Such data taken literally would mean that proper, superior anthropology is taught and practiced only in a few academic centers loca located in four corners of the world. I mean, this Chicago, London, and, uh, uh, Cambridge, and uh, all of them Western. One may as expect that some symbolic measures to mitigate visible hierarchies generated by structural relations of wealth and power would be found in domains directly depending on anthropological community members' decisions, who are aware of these inequalities. After all, as indicated in the, uh, in the introductory paragraph, scholar have, uh, scholars have debated the issue intensely for decades. And many of them recognize the problem and attempt to change it. The European Association of Social Anthropologists is a noble and inclusive enterprise that opened its doors to <coughs> continental ethnologists from the very beginning in, 2000, in 1990 or 89 even. I am proud to be a member of it since 1990. In general, YASA praises Egalité et Fraternité no doubt about it. However, with regard to our topic of persisting inequalities, a bitter remark can be made. EASA organizes by, by, uh, by, 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 by an annual conference to which keynote speakers are invited. Here is the list of the 17th. 1990, Coimbra, Ernest Gellner, Cambridge. Uh, 92, Prague, Luc de Hoysch, uh, Brussels. Uh, Oslo, 1994, Mary Douglas, London. 96, Barcelona, Frederick Barth, University of Oslo and Ethnographic Museum uh, in Oslo. 1998, Frankfurt am Main, Eric Wolf, New York. 2000, Kraków, Zygmunt Baumann, Leeds. 2002, Copenhagen, Louis Lanfer, University of New Mexico. 2004, Vienna, Achille Bempe, University of Witwatersrand. Uh, 2006, Bristol, Jean Komarov, Chicago. 2008, Ljubljana, Philippe Descola, Collège de France and Laboratoire d'Anthropologie Sociale. 2010, Maynut, Talal Assad, New York. Uh, 2012, Nanterre, Caroline Humphrey, Cambridge. 2014, Elizabeth Povinelli, Columbia. 2016, Didier Fassin, Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton and Paris. 2018, Stockholm, Sharham Korsrabi, Stockholm. Uh, 2020, Lisbon, Marilyn Stratern, Cambridge. 2022, Belfast, Athena, Athanasio, Pantheon, University of Social and Political Sciences, Athens, Trent in the West. Out of 17 distinguished scholars, no doubt about it. I'd love to read them. Five are from the UK and five from the US two from France and one from Belgium, Belgium, Norway, South Africa, Sweden and Greece. No one comes from Latin America or Asia. With respect to Central and Eastern European countries, 35 years after the end of history, in Europe the Iron Curtain hangs firmly, at least in anthropology. For scholarly appreciation in anthropology, not just Elbe, but even Rhine River remains a limes for anthropologists' empire. 
It is fully understandable that conference organizers seek out and, part, uh, uh, and the part participants wish to listen to scholars recognizing the scholarly community. As I signaled above, there are complex mechanisms that lead to uh, the situation where scholars coming from certain areas accrue such fully deserved appreciation. However, this lack of geographical diversity in honor allocation is, on the one hand, a part of this not the mechanism of academic hierarchies, and on the other, results from, from them. It doesn't facilitate a diversity, diversity of views and perspectives, the WCAA mission. Maybe there is some degree of truth in the stories told by Nobel Prize winners and Merton's observation that, and I quote Merton referring to this Nobel Prize here, eminent scientists get disproportionately credit, uh, great credit for their contribution to science, while relatively unknown scientists tend to go, get disproportionately little credit for comparable contributions." Unquote. This is Merton's conclusion from 1968. And my conclusion for all this. Today, it's common knowledge that we are all products of the history and societies in which we live. Our ideas and practices are contingent upon social relations and image, images available in a given place at certain periods of time. The significance ascribed to various images in a given social milieu is hierarchically ordered. This order is dynamic and results from the struggles for cultural hegemony as understood by Antonio Gramsci. Anthropologies and the resulting pecking order on, of their intellectual creations are not an exception in this regard, although they wish they were. Published books and articles and invented, conce uh, and invented con concepts and ideas are evaluated by the communities of scholars operating at various levels, local, regional, and global. These products and their producers are ranked according to these ju judgments. Second, one should keep in mind that, the, that academic knowledge is an inherent part of and parcel of a larger system of social, political, and economic dependencies and equalities. The above mentioned scientific practices outcomes, which are hierarchically structured according to the arbitrary principles of value ascription, stem ultimately from power relations between various groups of scientists, scientific interests, scholarly communities, countries, and region. The two, two processes combined lead inevitable to the establishment of regions in which within this academic system and according to its rationality, valuable and good science is produced, and other regions in which it is highly unlikely that innovative, innovative knowledge between, uh, meeting the rigorous scientific criteria established by valuable and good scientists can emerge. This distinction is often articulated as a division into centers and peripheries, at least since 1982 when uh, Gerholm and Hannes published this ethnos issue about centers and peripheries and islands, archipelagos, uh, centers and peripheries of academic knowledge production. The general and absolutized above uh, 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 statement that disregards other important factors at work, such as inertia, of intellectual tradition, scholars' mobility, and political regimes might be uplifting for those working in the most affluent countries and living in dominating intellectual societies and depressing for all practicing science outside these privileged, cent uh, privileged centers. From the perspective of the WCAA mission statement and years of raising the issue, some, some privileged call it whinging, uh, and efforts made by the activist groups, all these people involved in these movements, uh, Luzan Manifesto, et cetera, et cetera, and yeah, activist groups and individuals, the overall picture remains bleak and results are rather discouraging. That's practically the end of my lecture, maybe. some more data about it, but then, yeah, I promised this
<laughs> data that are also quite telling, yeah? How much per capita is spent on science in different countries? This is about this social economic inequalities that we see. And uh, it's depressing, <laughs> uplifting. Now you compare whether Hungary is better than Poland. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, look at the global picture. The country that spends most percentage of uh, uh, proportion of uh, GDP on science is Israel. The second one is Chi uh, um, South Korea. And of course, it is reflected mostly in, let's say, in technologies and that's because the, most of this money go there. Uh, social sciences, humanities are much more relative, but still, yeah, I think it has an impact. Okay, thank you very much. Juraj Buzalka, uh, Komenius University, Bratislava. Uh, I, I, I have been always happily listening to one of the few uh, figures of East European Academia who uh, have been listened to in the West, uh, and Professor Buchowski offered. He is some sort of ambassador of all of us in, in Western Academia. And if he is offering this uh, kind of hierarchical picture of knowledge, uh, it uh, might reach uh, the right ear uh, in, uh, among colleagues. But still, listening to this uh, rather uh, sober uh, figures, I'm wondering uh, how much this says about, let's say, not knowledge per se, but let's say some sort of uh, quality of knowledge, uh, or the, um, uh, how to say, uh, to, to, to speak it simply, like how to avoid charlatanism from the margins coming to the center, or how to actually, because science is hierarchy by definition, you have some superior knowledge and you say this is more superior, of course we have this anthropological relativizing of, of cultures and so on, but still there is some uh, knowledge that is superior because of some tradition of analysis of the world around us. So I'm just wondering who would be the uh, voice to be heard in, the, in this hierarchy from among my colleagues in my poor parochial academic setting. And this is not, I'm not complaining about it, I just know. I just know by, by heart that there is nobody who could even say something interesting uh, in, in, in that kind of uh, eloquent manner. So I'm just asking, perhaps you can reflect upon this uh, a bit more, like how to differentiate charlatanism from, let's say, more sober, intellectually biased uh, endeavor in, in pro knowledge production. Yeah, thank you for this question, which is, of course, a very difficult question, especially in the context of what I have just said, that there is a hierarchy and, and, uh, and therefore there is no chance for people from the outside of these centers to, to get their voice unless they, they go to these centers or are invited to these centers. There is something, I think there is something to it, what I have said, but there is also something to what you have said, yeah, that and the, the only way to, to distinguish good scholarship, well, in, te, let me, in, in hard sciences, it's, uh, it's, it seems to be more, uh, it seems to be easier uh, because there is a effect. You have a new, new medicine or it is effective or it's, it's not. You, you invent, uh, invent a new technological device that is useful or not, and then 
uh, or you discover some uh, some new particle in the CERN, <laughs> in CERN, and uh, or you discover a new planet somewhere in, out in the universe. Okay, in social sciences and humanities, it's of course much more difficult and uh, much more, I think, much more uh, social and. Uh, individual uh, acceptance or uh, attraction of the idea is involved but what we what we can apply for this is well i am from let's say a school of of thinking that says that there is uh, there is the disruption between social sciences and humanities in terms of uh, uh, ontology we deal with uh, with human subjects. Therefore, uh, famous Florian Zdaniecki's uh, uh, humanistic coefficient is is involved in it. That we deal with the ideas that people that people have, and therefore they, this is their perception of the world, and we think about the perception of the world that is given to us, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This is not actually not the point, but there is a um, methodological naturalism yeah that you in the scientific inquiry you respect some uh, some standards that that is uh, communicab communicability that is that uh, this is, and controllability yeah that you don't say things that you just want to you don't invent data that you just not invent anything or it's just crazy that you don't refer to the existing literature uh, and you just <coughs> make statements out of the blue or fake statements and so on and when we look at this and this then there is an individual uh, appreciation or lack of appreciation of a certain work and this is true that yeah there in our feel there is a, a set of there is a plenty of offers and it depends on our taste or our preferences that we we follow this or that scholar or this line of reasoning or other line of reasoning but uh, at the same time when we would like to remain within the social sciences and humanities then we have to follow this 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 principle that this is not a charlatanism but let's say this is based on ethnographic fieldwork informed not only by this ethnographic fieldwork but also of the debate on the topic that is raised and uh, yeah it's a lot of individualism in it yeah you you can have a certain preference for the interpretation of the same community yeah? and i don't know yonamami is a famous example uh, in anthropology for this different uh, perception of the same society by different scholars uh, also very controversial <laughs> ethnographic fieldwork by many of them but uh, uh, th uh, i think that this is something that we we actually practice yeah but then there is a question whether we open our eyes or we don't close our eyes to some ideas that are born outside these academic centers let's say in japan in hungary or in slovakia that you we all tend to and this is this kind of a attitude that most of us somehow share that we tend to refer directly to I don't know in sociology to Giddens and then and then I have nothing against Giddens I have nothing against Bourdieu yeah? but there were also some theories in sociology or in anthropology that were proposed or have been proposed in in the region that go unheard simply because they were invented or produced proposed by scholars not coming from these centers and then you have you know this is kind of a swirling effect yeah that well if you don't refer to this internationally recognized you don't refer i don't know to bourdieu giddens and so on and the, or salins and and uh, and uh, levi strauss whatever names you your uh, article won't be accepted to a to the so-called prestigious uh, uh, journal 
Yeah. So there is there is something to this uh, so, sociological, let's say, uh, to this uh, uh, production of knowledge and the recognition of knowledge produced produce in different areas, and we participate in it. Yeah. But I, what just me give you know, I, I wrote uh, I delivered some uh, article to uh, strange from our perspective, strange, but I think it's a very good open access journal in South Korea. And then I get a review, apparently written by some Western scholar or trained in the West scholar. And uh, the point was that, well, I do not refer to this or that and that. And I said, uh, these famous, let's say, names that dealt with immigration and the things like this. And I said, <laughs> my answer to this, uh, my response was, I, I did it on purpose because I don't need it to, to invoke these big names in order to explain some phenomena because there are scholars who deal directly with the issue and they seem to say uh, the same. And why should I just, you know, meet your expectation that I, I will refer to the same scholar that you, you know and you don't know the scholar I know? Yeah, or the production score right now. So yeah, the the yeah the principle of ERC is excellency, and I I respect it, and I think it's 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 a really transparent institution. But the whole rule of the game is somehow set by this by, by this setup of academia in general in 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 not only in Europe but in uh, worldwide. Yeah, the recruitment of, of the evaluators, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that causes that it is also much more difficult for us. Also because this is patterned on Anglo-American model. Yeah, the, the way you write application and so on. Uh, the, the way you reason, the way uh, arguments that, uh, the, that, that uh, how you provide it. So it's uh, yeah, either the choice for us in the case of ERC in a sense is either join them. If you can't beat them, join them. Yeah. Yeah. To legitimize uh, basically some alternative knowledge that is not worth to legitimize, let's say. Like, okay, yeah, I agree. There is a hierarchy. In that, but uh, in in this follow of of of, of let's say Anglo-Saxon uh, yep. academic way, but who offers the alternative? I'm I have always kept in high esteem Polish academia, but I I'm a little bit familiar with let's say Czech and Slovak academia, and there are not many names I would I would like to refer well, to as original original thinkers. So I would, call, for instance, uh, uh, I can give you a name, for instance, Juraj Buzalka. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm too young for, for, for this. Well, you are not that young anymore. Marcin <laughs> Lubasz. Uh, Does it work? Okay. Uh, doesn't uh, mm, from Jagiellonia University, Krakow. Uh, mm, thank you very much for this excellent, disturbing but excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I have a, a kind of comment, uh, uh, I and my comment uh, is not very far from uh, uh, URI problem. Uh, it is a question of uh, how do we as subordinated uh, uh, subaltern uh, part of, of Europe contribute to this uh, subordination? Because I have, you have, you made a very strong uh, point, strong, very strong case for how uh, Western, uh, uh, Western academic elite uh, uh, um, reproduces or maintains these uh, inequalities. And of course, your, your case, uh, you, ha you, ha you have proven your case. I think that uh, true, they, they do, uh, uh, even though there is a lot of talk about equality, egalitarianism, uh, etc. there is uh, this, this hard facts of, uh, uh, of basic statistics show that there is uh, 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 very strong inequality. True, but there is another question, 
And there's a question of how uh, this part of the world contribute to its own uh, uh, subordination. And of course, we, we can frame it theoretically, and we can frame it uh, empirically. And uh, 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 we can talk about Eastern European scholars who uh, deserve a kind of worldwide recognition, on the one hand, and hey, for example, they, uh, for some reasons, did not get this recognition. But uh, th there is a very interesting phenomenon of the uh, Eastern European scholars who are somehow eclipsed in their own countries. And one very powerful example is Bronisław Malinowski in Poland. Because, you know, uh, 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 the year 2022 marked uh, uh, 100 years from the publication of the Argonauts of the Western Pacific. How many conferences were organized in the West just because of this, uh, of this uh, 100 years? Four, five, maybe six. How many conferences were organized in Poland? One. One. And it was, uh, to, 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 uh, to say more, uh, organized by, by anthropologists from sociology department. So, uh, and how many scholars coming from Eastern Europe, maybe not as well recognized as Marinowski, uh, uh, in a sense, follow the, same, uh, pat follow the same pattern. So there is a, a, a very, I think, important question of how uh, uh, the scholarship from Eastern Europe is not only eclipsed by Western Europe, which is absolutely true. And I uh, subscribe to, the, to your position in 100%. But also there is a, a very, you know, a, a problematic and, uh, and frustrating link between uh, this uh, hegemony, uh, not only in, in Gramscian terms, but in, in Leninist terms. You know, Lenin, uh, who was actually a person who invented this idea of hegemony, uh, 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 understood it as a leadership, a kind of, you know, the, the, there is a kind of hegemony of the working class means that there is a kind of leadership. And uh, in a sense, Eastern European uh, scholars, to to a large extent, accept this kind of hegem hegemonic leadership of the Western European scholars, uh, and in some cases they forget about the uh, you know the quality of, of the production uh, of scientific production in their own countries. And, uh, you know, this, this case of Malinowski, for me, is very clear. And we have, in we can ask about, about, you know, the, for example, about uh, uh, the position of uh, scholars coming from, from, uh, uh, from this region, like, uh, like Polanyi, like Gellner, uh, like Malinowski, uh, like Ludwig Fleck, uh, you know. And, and I think that there is a problem in, in our, part of the world, that there is not something which I would call a critical mass of debate. Why uh, scholars such as uh, Malinowski are still, uh, 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 in a sense, uh, attractive to so many uh, 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 persons, uh, so, so many milieus in Western academia, but they are not that much important for scholars in Poland, at least if we measure this, this uh, 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 mm, level of importance in terms of the number of conferences. Obviously, it is not a good uh, index, perhaps, but one of, of the possible measurements. Uh, why uh, people like Ludwig Fleck got his reputation uh, for only when he was recognized by Thomas Kuhn? Uh, and uh, a kind of, you know, uh, blessing from him. And we could provide many examples of this kind that there is a kind of, there is a problem, problem here that we sometimes contribute. Uh, I don't think that on purpose, we contribute as, as an institu this institutional contribution to our own subordination. Mm. And 
maybe it doesn't sound uh, 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 nice, but, but it's also a kind of uh, uh, dimension to this uh, problem of, of this hierarchy, which, which we have to consider. Thank you. It was, well, I can comment to your comment. Yeah, that, well, in joking manner, because of, if you think globally that uh, there are much more money in the academia in the West, so they were able to organize five times more conferences than in Poland. One conference for this budget is, <laughs> is okay. Yeah, but then uh, I think that it was a great conference in Krakow, actually, organized by your colleagues and uh, very exhaustive in that sense that it also attracted uh, experts on Maninowski from all over the world. And I, yeah, I wouldn't say that Maninowski is somehow unrecognized and unknown in Poland or blocked by the Polish scholars. The, well, in my case, is, uh, whether I like Maninowski or not, I, I like his ethnography and some of his insights. I don't recognize him as a great Theoretician, but it's just my my uh, uh, my let's say taste for for anthropology. Otherwise, I, I don't have a feeling that there is some kind of uh, you know keeping blind eye on on on, on him and and yeah, he is recognized in Poland. I, I I don't agree with you that, that there is something wrong with Maninowski, who was a long time. Uh, a long time ago. But there is a, something more important, I think, to what you have said. And I, yeah, I, I partly agree with it. That we self, we are we ourselves to talk. We. Uh, we contribute to this uh, reproduction of this hierarchies uh, of knowledge. First, with the <laughs> sort of fascination with, with this uh, direct, and referring to, yeah, to, to uh, Especially after 1989, yeah, that yeah, there was the opening. There were uh, uh, scholarships uh, uh, offered, and so on. And th this was this fascination with the Western academia and Western scholarship. And uh, in result of this, we we disrupted uh, relations with our colleagues from from the region. And now this is a, one of the many cases now of re-establishing these this, uh, connections, yeah, these networks, uh, which goes on for, for some time. But then it was that, well, you and me sitting in your own academic center, uh, we were, you know, debating or uh, have uh, intellectual debates usually one-sided because the other side didn't hear this, with uh, gurus in, I don't know, Berkeley and, and uh, London School of Economics or in, uh, in the West in general, the US with big names and not with, with local uh, scholars. And uh, yeah, if we paid attention to what other people in our own countries or in the region say about the similar issues we want to, to discuss, Perhaps out of these discussions, some new ideas could have had emerged, and this is still going on. Yeah? So, so uh, yeah, the, the, the way to, to deal with it is, of course, we should not say, well, now we won't read these people from, from this uh, good, recognized as good uh, uh, and rich usually very rich uh, uh, institutions and so on. They are, they are good scholars and, and so on. But we should not blind ourselves to what's going on also in our region yeah, or in our own uh, local milieu that people also have something to say. And merging these two perspectives can bring some, some new results, I think. Yeah, otherwise, we'll be... We'll be stuck in this in this conundrum all the time and we in 20 years we'll have the similar conference or you will have similar conference <laughs> and uh, on the same topic yeah but a lot there is something to this budget so. Uh, I'm Honza Kanyak from uh, University of Western Bohemia. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. I would like to ask, I'm not sure if I understand well, 
you mentioned English-based knowledge, and if I understand well, it's a connected with language, but uh, in which manner it's connected with the methodology? It's maybe some, maybe some same uh, reflection uh, as uh, was mentioned, because. Uh, um, I mean that uh, Malinovsky in preface of his uh, monograph Argonauts wrote something like that no one can make uh, just good description of another culture as man who is uh, well trained in scientific methods. Uh, and I mean that uh, most of scientific methods is uh, created by Western uh, researchers or uh, no. uh, scientists. So, from your point of view, how we can um, react or uh, how we can uh, what we can do with this uh, with this fact if the English based knowledge is related also to the kind of methodology uh, during we make and create uh, knowledge and wisdom of the world Thank you so much uh, well, in terms of methodology i uh, I'm not. I'm not that sure that all methodology has been created in uh, English uh, countries, English-speaking countries, and uh, ethnography as a method was invented in the British Academia by somebody coming from empiric school in Krakow and, 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 uh, and uh, I think that actually in anthropology itself, yeah, there, there were uh, and there are very, uh, very good ethnographers. There have been very good ethnographers for years and they have collected excellent materials that are now reused very often by, by, uh, by scholars who uh, practice historical anthropology and they find them very exciting. I've mentioned the name of Kasper Pawłocki, and uh, who, who, who actually uses this ethnographic materials collected in the, also in the post-war period for new interpretations of some, uh, some uh, phenomena. By the way, he also uh, rediscovered a certain, I mean, it's a footnote, yeah, uh, that uh, 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 a work of uh, Josef Bursta, uh, who worked about the alcohol consumption in the Polish countryside uh, in 1949. And he said that, well, actually this was the ideas that behind this work were very similar to uh, to those that were uh, inve invented by Thompson only <laughs> 30 years later. <laughs> yeah, but he hadn't read Bursta before, but he invented it in the British Academy. But uh, in terms of sociology, I mean, there there is a, I mean, in sociology, I, as far as I know, and there are much more better experts than I. The Polish methodological school in uh, in sociology was uh, quite excellent. Yeah, am I right? I mean, Stefan Novak and and and, and, uh, and others, and uh, comparable to to. So I I don't exactly know what do you mean by by methodology. Yeah, but in in anthropology we we are pretty certain of what we understand by, by good methodological work in terms of uh, methodology in the field site, yeah? But then there is also a methodology in a larger sense, how to, what we do with these materials, yeah? And then this is a, a kind of a inbred or implanted in our minds uh, mm, uh, conviction that we, that the, theories that help us to interpret these materials are born in the academic centers. And we import the theories in order to interpret our, our data. And we are data collectors who apply these uh, big ideas coming from, I don't know, Cambridge, Berkeley, and Chicago. And then uh, that this is a, with this, we can get a stamp of good anthropologists. But my, my claim or my, my appeal is that, well, not necessarily, yeah? That doesn't mean that we shouldn't read these guys. 
excellent scholars, friends of us in many cases. And then it, it's not, this is not a statement against, this is a statement for. Yeah? Please diversify our sources of, of uh, inspiration, so to say. Yeah? And look around. It's, it doesn't have, you doesn't have to go to, uh, to California to, to find the ideas to interpret uh, the phenomenon of racialization of uh, uh, Roma or Muslims <laughs> in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Yeah? And not all the ideas that are directly brought here, the idea of the concept of race or ra racism or racialization, that they have to they have to be relativized to the, to this context yeah when you you just take it and you apply it to uh, from the american context to central european context it doesn't work so yeah this is should be a constant reworking and uh, reapplication and borrowing from other colleagues in, from our surroundings maybe also from uh, comenius university you're right. So I absolutely agree. Go on, go on. I will just repeat what you already professor. I have no question. Do we have? I don't want to torture you, Miha. You don't torture me. Okay, only. So we keep up from Budapest at the university. Uh, only one uh, idea, maybe it can be nice, I don't know how the Visegrad Fund budget works, but maybe go to Latin America and discuss them, because in Latin America uh, this decolonizing of anthropology is super powerful and it would be very so provoking to discuss this topic with them from our perspective, because in Eastern Europe, from the Latin American perspective, we are also part of Europe, the mm -hmm. colonizers part, but mm -hmm. Not, but not like the other colonizers, so how it is, how it, and in Malvinovsky the question also arises, he, how was he, or he was a colonizer, anthropologist, or, an, or not, because he's Eastern European, but not, this is my question, my question is, sorry, um, about the Central European University, what do you think about the CEU from the perspective of your presentation? especially because you were there when it was set up and you, you saw the CU's history. Um, um, because this is a super interesting question in a micro level, what you are talking about, that there was, there is, but it, now it's in Austria, but because the Hungarian government kicked them out, it's a pity. And, but this is one of the reasons why, for example, the Hungarian Academy or other academies in Central European were not fighting against this kicking out from Hungary, the tragic situation uh, besides CU. Of course, we were protesting a lot, but not enough. And that was not enough. And why? The question arises, when the CU started uh, his its career here in Eastern Europe, that was a possibility somehow we saw them as a help for somehow reaching the global anthropological, social, scientific world. But it turned out from a lot of local anthropologist perspective like some kind of self-colonization too. So there were bubbles. The bubbles had people from Eastern Europe and they almost never invited any local anthropologist, for example, like a key keynote or expert or participate in programs or, or, or conferences. And either there were not enough strong connections between the local universities and CU, or not enough. Only the people inside of CU, Hungarians, Polish, Czechs, and Slovaks, and Romanians, and others, who were in their network, personal networks, they were the cooperators from the outsider uh, universities. So that was a possibility. Maybe there is still a possibility, but how do you see it? Mm -hmm. um, it was in a, like your presentation, but only in a micro level, or it was different, mm -hmm. it can be better. Yeah. First of all, you know, any restriction on academia and kicking out the university of the country is uh, it's a tragedy and it's a sign of uh, uh, index of, uh, <laughs> of a degree of totalitarian power that is in a given country. 
Second, yeah, the, I, I perceive CEO as a kind of a very good academic initiative that uh, uh, is interested in and practice or uh, uh, implemented uh, um, transfer of knowledge or flow of knowledge, mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe the, the, there was a kind of a mistake on the on the part of uh, of the CEO authorities, so to say, or staff, that they were interested and they saw their mission as a transfer of knowledge instead of a flow of knowledge in both directions. Mm -hmm. And maybe this would be, I think it would be very helpful for them and also for for the atmosphere in uh, among academ academics in Budapest as a, or Hungary as a whole uh, yeah, as a as a whole academic la uh, world media so yeah, if there if there was a lack of such you know interactions then uh, then it should not should have not take took place okay yeah During the break. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to thank you, Michal Buchowski, for his excellent presentation. And uh, we can continue our discussion during the break. Uh, okay. <laughs>